uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, which is just about you know an hour north of us here. Um, so we're, I don't, uh, we're not seeing your screen. Is everybody seeing his screen? Or is it just my problem? I am, yeah. I, see I can see it. We're, we're I can see it. it. I can see yep. as well. Yeah. Yep. OK, so should I keep going? Yes, keep going. I see it now. OK, great. Um, so uh, this is Point Reyes, and, uh, and uh, I like to work there because it's um, not just a beautiful landscape, which you can see here. This is close to Limitour Beach. Um, but if you look at this landscape, it's got a really patchy vegetation matrix. You can see these pines here kind of as these dark green patches. Um, and this has made it a, a really cool place for me to study the community assembly dynamics uh, of fungi. Uh, this is in part because the um, plants there also have different types of uh, fungal symbiotic association. Uh, and in particular, uh, bishop pine, uh, this tree right here, this which is those dark green patches, uh, associates with a type of uh, fungi known as ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so these are uh, root symbioses um, that are really important for the plant in uh, taking up limiting nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil. Um, and so if you could uh, you know, uh, dig into the ground there and look at some of these roots, this is something like what you'd find. These kind of red spots here are plant roots, the fine roots of the plant. Uh, and all that kind of white wefty stuff is the hyphae of fungi that grow around the roots and into the roots. And actually this uh, graph on the bottom here is a cross section of a root. And you can see these uh, areas here are fungal tissue that have completely grown around uh, the first few layers of the cortical cells of the root. Um, and so there's a diverse community of fungi that form this type of a, a symbiosis uh, with uh, bishop pine here. And what makes this uh, fun from a community assembly perspective is that um, these uh, associations are host specific and obligate for the fungus. So it can really only associate with uh, its hosts. And it grows in this matrix of vegetation here, uh, primarily defined by things like grasses and coyote brush um, that are arbuscular mycorrhizal. So they form a very different type of host-specific association. So this makes it a nice setup for trying to understand a community assembly and dispersal of fungi um, in, this, uh, in this landscape. Uh, and because the fungi are obligate and host specific, we can do uh, experiments to ask questions about how fungal dispersal influences community assembly, which has been one of the things I've been interested in for a long time, uh, because whether or not dispersal is important in microbial communities has been kind of a, a hot topic or a hot button uh, controversial topic in microbial ecology for a while. So uh, because these fungi are host specific, we know the only places they can make uh, spores and disperse them from, which is their host trees. Um, and so you can see here in this little cartoon mock-up, a, a little patch of trees. And we can go and take places where we know these trees are and go out into this uh, coastal scrub landscape and collect soils at different distances away from these uh, host trees. And then we can do kind of a greenhouse bioassay where we take these soils and grow pine seedlings in them and assess the proportion of the root system or the number of seedlings that are colonized uh, by these uh, fungi as a, as a kind of a measure of inoculum potential. And so we can make graphs like this uh, cartoon here. On the y-axis, you can see this is the proportion of seedlings that are colonized by these fungi. And on the x-axis here, this is how far away we are from established pines. And if we see something like this flat line here, this would be consistent with the idea that there's no dispersal limitation of these fungi. And so this means that from a plant's perspective, wherever a pine seedling might establish in this coastal scrub, uh, it's always going to be able to find uh, its ectomycorrhizal fungal partners. By contrast, if you see something like this, uh, this would suggest that the spores of these ectomycorrhizal fungi can only move limited distances. Um, and so inoculum potential declines as you move away from the forest edge. And there are places in the landscape where these uh, pine seedlings uh, might not be able to find their partners. Um, and so this is real data from a study that was led by my graduate student here, uh, Gabriel Smith. Uh, and you can see quite clearly in this figure that inoculum potential declines as you move away from the edge of the forest and that as you move farther away from these spore sources, the trees, uh, you get lower and lower colonization of these pine seedlings. So this is consistent with the idea of dispersal limitation uh, for the fungi. Um, what's interesting about that figure is that is sort of a composite figure. So that represents seedlings that are colonized by any ectomycorrhizal fun fungus. Um, but uh, we can do, uh, we use molecular tools to actually identify using DNA sequences the specific fungi that colonize the roots of these pine seedlings. Uh, 
And so what you can see, quite, which is quite interesting to me, is that when you identify the specific species of ectomycorrhizal fungi on these seedling roots, uh, that the ectomycorrhizal fungi themselves differ quite dramatically in their dispersal capabilities. Um, and uh, we identify these from fungal tissue on roots, but many of the ectomycorrhizal fungi are mushroom formers. So these are mushrooms to kind of give you an idea. Uh, these are common fungi, so you might see them around as you're, as you're walking in uh, uh, ecosystems around here. So for example, these two taxa here, Helvella and Tomentella, you can see they're only able to colonize seedlings a few meters away, so they're not very good from the forest edge, so they're not very good dispersers. Um, whereas these guys down here, Thalephora terrestris and Suillus pungens, uh, they're capable of colonizing seedlings tens or hundreds of meters away from the edge of the forest. The other interesting thing to me about this particular figure is you'll notice that these are not um, kind of linear decay uh, relationships away from the edge of the forest, that many of these taxa have peaks in colonization at intermediate distances away from the edge of the forest. Um, and what we have shown essentially is that when you measure spore dispersal directly using quantitative PCR, um, spore concentrations are always declining away from the edge of the forest. Um, and so what we've shown in other studies is that these uh, kind of intermediate peaks in colonization are actually due to competitive interactions. And in particular, these things that don't disperse very well are competitive or superior competitors, and they outcompete these things like Sewillus here, which is a good disperser. And so it's not able to colonize to the forest edge, even though it makes lots of spores, and it can really only be effective at long distances away. So this is evidence for this uh, kind of classic competition colonization trade-off uh, in ecology. So uh, the other thing we're really interested in is how important it is that uh, these kinds of fungi like Sewillus pungens are able to disperse long distances and find these pine seedlings. Does it matter for the ability of the pines to establish in this vegetation? So I had a, a whole other section uh, on, on this question that I had to cut because I tend to present too much data and talk too long. So uh, just to summarize it really quickly, an experiment that we published in uh, Journal of Ecology, um, we tried to simulate the dispersal of ectomycorrhizal fungi and see how it affected uh, competition between bishop pine uh, and this dominant arbuscular mycorrhizal shrub, coyote brush. Uh, and so we did things where we grew the bishop pine uh, and the coyote brush together in these little pots. Uh, and then we added the spores of this one fungus, uh, Swillus pungens, at different times. And so you can see here, uh, this is where we added spores of uh, Swillus after only a month after establishing the seedlings. And you can see really only pines here. You don't see the baccarus at all. If you begin to delay the arrival of the spores of the ectomycorrhizal fungus by a few months, you can see the pine seedlings, these are all the same age, are quite a bit smaller. Um, and uh, the baccarus is beginning to show up. And if you make sure that the ectomycorrhizal fungi don't arrive at all, so we never add the spores, you can see that the pines are still able to survive and hang on, but they're really being outcompeted uh, by these much larger baccarus. And so not only whether or not these spores of the ectomycorrhizal fungi can find uh, the plants, but when they find the plants becomes really important in determining who wins out in competition between seedlings of these species and establishing uh, in this vegetation. So the other part we were interested in is um, because there is a huge diversity of these uh, ectomycorrhizal mutualists that associate with pines, uh, we want to know, you know, how functionally different they are from each other and whether it matters uh, which, which fungus uh, finds a seedling or which fungus colonizes a seedling. And so we did an experiment, uh, which I'll show you here, trying to look at uh, functional differences between these two fungi here, uh, the Lephora terrestris and Suillus pungens. Um, and we took what uh, I'll call a niche mapping, or a symbiotic niche mapping approach. And this is work that was led by a postdoc in my lab, uh, Michael Van Newland, right here. And uh, I like this definition from Robert Holt of, of what the Hutchinsonian niche is. Um, and he writes here that one can represent the potential environments an organism faces as an abstract space with axes corresponding to environmental factors that affect organismal performance. The niche then is a mapping of population dynamics onto this space. So a niche basically is a map of how well a species performs across some abstract set of environmental conditions. So we tried to take this approach by growing uh, pine seedlings along these two-dimensional gradients of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, so the two soil nutrients that most limit plant growth. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, this is a two-dimensional gradient of nitrogen, going from low nitrogen to high nitrogen, and phosphorus, low phosphorus to high phosphorus, uh, 
And we grew pine seedlings in pots uh, at all combinations and fertilized them at all different combinations of nitrogen and phosphorus from you know, low, low N, low P to high N, high P and everywhere in between. So we grew seedlings in the greenhouse either by themselves, so no mycorrhizal partners, uh, with this fungus, the Lephora terrestris, uh, with this fungus, Sewillus pungens, uh, or with both of these two fungi together. Uh, and we assayed the uh, size of the seedlings as kind of a proxy for population dynamics. So it's not quite population dynamics, but hopefully it's a reasonable proxy of this to see how well they performed across this, uh, the abiotic NMP gradient, but also this biotic gradient of different uh, mycorrhizal partners. So this is what um, this type of a niche map or a mapped niche looks like. Um, on the y-axis, you can see uh, on the z-axis, sorry, this is plant biomass. Um, and then these two, uh, the y and the x are these two-dimensional nitrogen and, and phosphorus gradients. Uh, and these different panels show the different uh, biological treatments. So no mycorrhizal fungi, thalephora suillus or thalephora plus suillus. Um, and the thing that jumps out at you most probably from looking at this is that uh, it's not uh, rocket science that when you give plants a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, they get bigger. And this is true across all the different treatments that, that we had here. Um, and you can think of the size, the volume of this space here um, as uh, akin to this uh, mapping the, the niche space a plant is able to occupy across this two-dimensional nutrient gradient. Um, but what I think to me gets really interesting is when you compare the uh, different biological treatments, so you compare plants uh, growing with thalephora versus these non-mycorrhizal controls. And you, what we're plotting here is the uh, relative increase in biomass for thalephora colonized plants versus uncolonized plants. So these red colors here show um, increases in biomass relative to the control. Blue colors are decreases in biomass relative to the controls. Uh, and what you can see quite clearly from looking at this uh, graph is that for thalephora, there's this really big peak where it's really beneficial to plant growth and this is where nitrogen is really in excess. There's lots of nitrogen in the system, but there's not very much phosphorus. And so we interpret this to mean that thalephora is actually a phosphorus specialist and that it provides phosphorus when phosphorus is limiting to the plants. Um, we get the opposite result here with this other fungus, uh, Sewillus, where it uh, most improves plant growth when phosphorus is really abundant in the system, uh, but nitrogen is very limiting. And we interpret this to mean that uh, Sewillus is a nitrogen specialist. And so what we have here is a clear example for these two different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi, uh, functional specialization and the nutrients that they provide for their plants. Um, and the types of conditions in which they uh, enable the plant to expand their niche to include. So even though these two fungi are complementary, maybe, maybe to me the in most interesting thing about this is when you compare plants that have both of these fungi versus the controls, you see something that we didn't quite expect. So when two mutualists are complementary, we'd expect that overall they would actually help plant growth. Um, but what we find is that when you compare this, this kind of big area here of blue reduced growth gets larger. Um, but also this peak here where Sewillus was really beneficial at high P, low N, uh, it goes away. It gets uh, tamped down a little bit. Uh, and the same thing is true somewhat for the lephora. It still does, uh, still, you still see a growth benefit here, but it's, the peak is smaller than, uh, than it was when it's growing by itself. And this is, uh, gets back to this idea of these competition colonization trade-offs. And so what we think is happening here is that Sewillus is not a very good competitor. And so even though the plant might benefit from associating with it here, it's outcompeted by telephora, which reduces the potential of the plant to reap the benefits of this uh, mycorrhizal partner. And so to me, this type of antagonism really drives home that in order to understand how plants uh, benefit from the types of uh, diverse mutualists that they associate with, um, that we really need to think uh, explicitly about the community assembly dynamics um, of these microorganisms themselves. So uh, just kind of wrapping up here, uh, hopefully the three things I've convinced you of is that dispersal is really important for microbes uh, and that uh, dispersal limitation dramatically influences community assembly of uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, and that when or who arrives uh, really can change the outcome of plant competition and also whether particular types of environments um, are within or outside of uh, the host plant niche. So with that, um, I don't know, uh, Athena, if you want me to answer questions uh, now or if there's time for questions or if you want to do this somewhat differently. Um, yeah, does anybody have a question for Kibir? You can type a question mark in the chat and I'll call on you. <laughs> 
Uh, Megan? Yeah. So one thing I noticed when you were talking about the functional antagonism mm. was that um, even in the high nitrogen, high phosphorus treatment, um, they're still not doing as well. And I was wondering what you thought that was attributable to. Because even in, in each of the um, individual treatments with the Sewillus and the Thalephora, it looks like in the high nitrogen, high phosphorus, they're still doing pretty well. And that goes away with the, uh, with the combination. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think one of the things that was interesting to us about the results that we get here is that you can see there's this kind of window down the diagonal where uh, no matter what treatment you're in, uh, the fungi tend to be less beneficial. Um, and the thing to note about that is that this is um, the different combinations along these two nutrient axes are based on the formulation of a pine specific nutrient growth medium. And so um, this is, you know, if you look at the one to one between N and P, this is the, in theory, the ideal ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and so we think these other kind of blue areas here and here uh, are really places where um, the plant has all the nutrients it needs in uh, equal ratios. And so it doesn't really need the fungus because the, the nutrients it's, it needs are there. And there's not any one thing that's particularly limiting. So what we think is actually going on here at the sort of, um, at this high N, high P is maybe something different where um, we're fertilizing at a really high level and in um, kind of e equal stoichiometric ratios net relative to what the plant needs. And so here, our kind of hypothesis is that maybe it's the nutrients are actually flushing through really rapidly and that at these really high nutrient uh, fertilization rates that maybe the mycelium is actually helping capture some of the nutrients before they flush out of the system. And that's why you get this kind of high N, high P growth peak for both the Suillus and the Thalephora. Now, why that goes away here, uh, my suspicion, and I don't know the answer, and this would be really cool to know, is that um, maybe what's happening is that when the fungi are more interested in competing with each other, that they're putting more of their carbon energy into kind of fighting and less of their carbon energy, less of the energy that they've got into things like uh, nutrient capture. Uh, or maybe, um, you know, the fact that they're competing means that this mycelial network is less developed and so it has less of this capacity to stop um, nutrients from leaching out of the system. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Monica Shepherd. Um, I knew Monica when she was an undergrad intern at Rosie Gillespie's lab where I did my PhD, but she's now a PhD student herself at the University of Greifswald in Germany. And she's going to talk about spider wasp microbiome. Yeah, so it's, um, thanks Athena for giving me the opportunity. It's wasp spiders, um, which are just <laughs> named thus because of the way they look and you'll see that in a second. So I will uh, present. Can you all hear me? Yes. Cool. All right. So now you should see the slides. Um, yeah. So as Athena said, I'm a PhD student in Germany at the University of Greifswald, and I'm working on this beautiful wasp spider, Argaia pibrunichi, is part of my, uh, it's the focal organism for my PhD. Uh, all of the, the data that I'm about to present has been recently published as the first um, paper in my PhD. So if you want more details on methodology or um, statistical analysis or anything like that, you can find it in the publication or ask me via email or afterwards. So to jump right in, the wasp spider, Argaia pupernichi, is a spider species undergoing rapid range expansion in Europe. Rapid meaning in the last um, century, it's moved from the Mediterranean, sort of mild oceanic climate into the Baltic states and Scandinavia with a continental climate that's characterized by colder winters and um, greater variability between seasons. So we are interested and I am interested in the species for that region, reason. And um, one of the first angles that I took as a preliminary study was to look into the microbiome, largely due to a study that showed that endosymbiotic bacteria, specifically in this case, rickettsia, affected dispersal propensity in a spider species. For the case of Argaia pibernichi, no one, it had been looked into before the microbiome, but no one had found any of the classic endosymbionts, and they'd only used targeted approaches, um, PCR assays and things like that, to look for specific Wolbachia, Buchnera, those kinds of endosymbionts. So no one had done sort of broad uh, overall study of the total microbiome. So that's what we did. We collected adults from um, a population in Estonia here in Perinu, if you can see my mouse, 
and in Greifswald. And those adults um, we dissected and immediately froze, and we dissected them under sterile conditions. And then we took um, some females from the field in Pernu and a southern Germany site in Kalkplek. And those females we allowed to live in the lab, we fed them on a controlled diet. And then once they had overposited, laid eggs, we froze the offspring and sequenced them as well. So the study is, as I said, sort of preliminary. The sample size per um, location in Pernu and Greifswald was three adult females for each population. And then it was one family of offspring for the uh, spiderlings to just put that out there right at the beginning. So we did 16S amplicon sequencing with the V4 region um, and just of those different tissue types within the females dissected and the whole bodies of the spider lines. And we did this with four research questions in mind, the first being sort of broad and overarching, does the species possess a multi-species microbiome at all? And then if so, are there population level differences in the microbiome? And because we performed this dissection, we wanted to know if there was any localization of specific microbes in certain tissues. And I'm not sure if you can see the last point, I had some trouble with this earlier. The final question and why we sequenced the spiderlings was to look if there's any evidence um, of vertical transmission of the microbiome or of any certain members of the microbiome. And I'll already jump into the results. Um, the main finding from this study was that the species is dominated by a single bacterial symbiont we dubbed it DUSA, which stands for Dominant Unknown Symbiont of Argaia pibernichi. And in these pie charts, you can see in this royal blue color, that is the unknown symbiont. So it's a single amplicon sequence variant. Um, so our proxy for species in this study, which dominates almost every single tissue type in both populations from Germany and Estonia. And um, when I say that it's novel or unknown from this 16S amplicon sequencing, it had less than 80% similarity to any um, previously known or sequenced bacterium. And we wanted to get a little bit more insight into this one ASV. So we did a whole 16S sequence with PacBio, so the full length of the 16S gene, and performed um, a gene tree based on that. I'll zoom into the area where it occurs. It does fall within a, a well-known phylum of um, arthropod symbionts, the tenericutes, but it is um, with this, even the full length 16S less than 85% sequence identity to other bacteria. So it's something new. It's certainly within um, the tenericutes, which contain a lot of endosymbiotic bacteria of arthropods, but we're very excited by this finding and it's, uh, we felt like it was a really uh, confirmation to if it hasn't been looked for, go ahead and take a look into these non-model organisms which we've been hearing about the last few days. Secondarily, it became a secondary finding once we found this uh, one really interesting ASV, but we did want to look into the differentiation between populations and tissue types. So we did this using um, an NMDS analysis, Permanova test uh, with NMDS visualization of the um, more than 200 amplicon sequence variants that we found in the different tissue types. And uh, I didn't put the, the statistical values here, but I will say them. Uh, we found significant with Permanova analysis differentiation between the populations and also between individuals, but the R squared values were really low with around 5% variation of, um, explained by population and individual and no significant differentiation of the tissue types. So that answered the second or third research question. And lastly, uh, we wanted to know if spiderlings, the offspring contained any bacteria. And what we found is that they're really dominated by this one sequence variant. So our DUSA um, does appear to be um, vertically transmitted. Of course, we haven't done any tests, uh, experiments to show that how it's passed um, from mother to offspring. However, eggs are quickly encased in silk, which has been shown to, um, while it's not antibacterial necessarily, it does repel bacteria. So it's a fairly, we, we believe, sterile environment that they've been deposited into. So the, there's no environmental um, interaction with these spiderlings. So this should come directly from their mothers. So to summarize, um, these are the research questions we visited. Argaia pibernichi does possess a multi-species microbiome. We did find, although very slight in terms of the statistics, differentiation according to population, 
um, but no localization in specific tissues. I want to give some caveats with this, of course, and um, I know very intimately the drawbacks of the study, but um, it could be that we didn't find any tissue differentiation because of the overwhelming dominance of this one single sequence variant. So the ma vast majority of reads in our sequencing run went to a single sequence variant. So if there is localization um, uninvolved with that one um, endosymbiont, because that one's really everywhere, um, then it was just too subtle for us to pick up with this uh, dominant species. And finally, is the microbiome vertically transmitted? It appears from this um, first check that at least this one um, element of the microbiome is vertically transmitted from mother to offspring. And uh, with that, I'll just mention where we want to go with this project, because as I said, we, we looked uh, uh, look into the dark and see what you'll find, and we are really excited about this um, unknown symbiont. So we are looking, going to do a genome assembly and functional annotation of the bacterium. Uh, this will be a metagenome assembled genome. We don't, um, we don't think, and we haven't actually started trying to isolate it, but we do have the genome from the spider, which I'll talk about in a few weeks. And from that, we can um, assemble the bacterial genome, which will allow us to do some phylogenomics and an interesting aspect as well. We've already started, we have a PCR assay for the unknown symbiont. And um, when we've looked across different populations in the world, that's the map at the bottom, we find the same amplicone sequence variant in any of the blue spots, so across this Paleoarctic range. However, it's absent in the red spots in the Azor Islands and Madeira. It could be that there's a different strain there, which we're not picking up with the PCR assay. Um, but we're excited about that sort of phylogeographic signal. Um, we also want to do fish fluorescence in situ hybridization to localize the microbes in the tissue because I do, um, I do have concerns about the method with dissection. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And you know, if you dream big, then um, some antibiotic assays to cure the, the, species, uh, the spiders and see what the functional implications of that are. So um, here's my references and. If you have any questions, I look forward to hearing them. Back to the outlook. Thanks, Monica. Questions for Monica. All right, moving on. Um, our next speaker is. Is there a second? Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Jaime Chavez. He is Jaime. Are you in Are you in San Francisco or Ecuador right now? Yeah, I'm actually in, in Ecuador right now. Oh, so Jaime is a new assistant professor at San Francisco State University. Um, he's still in Ecuador, as you know. Um, so. We look forward to having you in the neighborhood. Um, he's going to talk about Galapagos finches. Thank you, Athena. Can you see my uh, my slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, yes, this is the work that I have done here um, in uh, in Ecuador, and um, what I'm going to present today is some some um, interesting findings in terms of the microbiome associations with finches on the Galapagos. And uh, particularly, this uh, finding was pretty uh, striking about the um, incredible, you know, vampire finches on the Galapagos Islands. So um, I have done this little um, modification of the classic um, Beak of the Finch, um, which is an incredible book that uh, probably got me started studying uh, finches. So, with, uh, so we're talking about the bite of the finch today. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time in introducing um, the um, the study system, but I really want to spend time uh, sharing uh, the acknowledgments of so many incredible collaborators that um, I was able to work with, uh, particularly uh, Xi Jing here. Um, there was you know super super uh, interesting paper that we put together um, about bat and and vampire finches microbiome, and a bunch of other people from Occidental and Miami, uh, John, Victoria, Orphan, Shana. So um, I just want to start acknowledging all these incredible uh, collaborators that I had through through these two papers that I want to be presenting today. 
Um, when we're talking about Darwin's finches, obviously there's little introduction about these, this group of birds. Um, one of the most important things to, to just you know, keep in mind about this group of birds is there's quite a, a young radiation on the Galapagos Islands, around 18 species. And I have here a question mark kind of uh, asterisk because you know, more and more data uh, coming in the next years have showed that these are actually multiple species in some of the groups. But the most important things about these birds is that they're probably one of the most iconic examples of adapted radiations. And you know, seeing these incredible uh, radiation and beak shapes, we now know that it has something to do with food selection. So natural selection on beak shape is a result of this incredible variation in, in beak sizes. So one of the, um, the quotes that got me to think about this project was that it is, it is thought that um, the acquisition of new diet is a fundamental driver for the evolution of new species and hence differentiation in the gut microbiome. So um, when you have time spending uh, looking at finches on the Galapagos, these birds have incredible diversity of uh, diverse diet. So you can see here the ground finches feeding on seeds, these vegetarian finch feeding on part of the flower, woodpecker finches, cactus finches going into the cactus and pollen of the Opuntia cacti, and the super weird vampire finch that feeds on blood of these big marine birds. So um, if we are going to expect any microbiome association based on diet, finches actually is one of the most attractive groups to examine how this uh, host diet might affect microbial communities. And as I mentioned before, this is a very uh, recent radiation. So over you know, relatively short periods of time, this is gonna be um, incredible to explore that. So we went uh, ahead and, and wanted to ask, you know, how does diet affect finch gut microbiome? Um, and in order to do that, well, we went through different islands on the Galapagos Islands. We were catching a lot of these birds and collecting their fecal samples. And we extract the whole DNA from, from these samples. And we did high throughput sequencing of 16 um, sRNA gene. And what we wanted to do is to, um, you know, the expectations were being here that once we have these, this, the whole ATUs and the sequence from all these um, samples, that different uh, microbiome identities will be clustered in different clouds depending on the diet of the finches. So you will probably find microbiomes that are more associated with uh, seed plants over here, uh, you know, birds that feed on cactus and pollen over here and invertebrates over here. So that, that's a little bit what we, we went into in our predictions, knowing that this, this might be a very tight correlation between these two things. Um, but what happens is that um, we did not find really much differences on microbiomes um, across most of the, the finch species here. And again, these are diets that are very diverse, um, but this is only when we exclude the vampire finches what happens when we include the finches? You know, we find a very significant, significant uh, difference between the uh, associations uh, between some type of bacteria in this case and the vampire finches. So we went in more detail to look up what actually these, um, you know, data points were telling us about the identity of these bacteria in Darwin's finches that feed on blood. And if I just want to show you quickly, I, I know if I can uh, show you um, a video here, but these are the um, the Nazca boobies. These are these these marine birds that are the source of blood for these little finches here. This is the only species in the world that is known to have this behavior in which um, they would actually inflict the wound on the on the bird. And this is a learned behavior. So some of the young birds are going to learn how to do this, and they're just you know checking it out. And you can see here some of the blood coming out of the Nazca booby. So what, you know, why these birds are so different in the microbiome compared to the rest of Darwin finches. So one of the things that we found is that uh, fuso bacteria is the most common, uh, you know, identity or the bacteria that we found in the vampire finches. And the cool thing about these bacteria is that it's very commonly found on carrion eating birds and carnivorous birds like vultures, like old world vultures, they are, you know, packed with foods of bacteria. So there's a very cool association between kind of the same diet here, but this is a tiny passerine in the middle of the Pacific, right, compared to these larger birds that are, uh, you know, comparing, sharing more 
uh, microbiomes with a, an array of carnivorous species. Um, the next thing that we wanted to look into about the, the uniqueness about these vampire finches is that, that we wanted to look into the isotope signature that these birds might have. And as you probably know, the two most common isotopes in nature are carbon-13 and nitrogen-15. And depending on the diet that any um, animal would have, you can uh, look the ratio between these two isotopes and try to get an idea of what kind of um, diet these, these animals could have. So based on data published somewhere else, we were trying to figure out where did our um, birds, you know, based on this um, isotope analysis will fall. So you have the ground finches kind of to be, you know, vegetarian diet. And as you move up in this scale, you have, you know, the large marine predators. And to our surprise, we found the vampire finches have one of the highest values for uh, nitrogen 15. And what we think here is that the finches by acquiring the blood directly from marine birds, they're kind of like stealing the signature, uh, the isotopic signature from these birds. And that's how we have a high value uh, of nitrogen 15 on their feathers in this case for the, um, uh, the vampire finches. So the, the, you know, with these results, something that um, we wanted to look forward was, okay, well, this is a cool adaptation on vampire finches. Is this something similar in other vertebrates that uh, feed on blood? So as I mentioned, this is a work that uh, we started with C. John, and we wanted to look at if there's any convergence in the taxonomy of the microbiome found on vampire finches and on vampire bats. So in this case here, we look at the abundance of lineages in non-blood eating bats, you will see on the first uh, part of the graph, compared to vampire bats. And the same thing between the finches that will feed on you know, seeds and other parts of uh, plants and the vampire finches, and then compare between vampire finches and bats. So we assay a bunch of uh, microbiomes as well from vampire bats and the same data from our the Darwin finches. And the first thing that we found is that we have very mixed results. So is there convergence in taxonomy? Well, partially, yes. One of the interesting things we found is this uh, peptostreptococcasia group uh, is very common between the vampire bats and the vampire finches. Um, and these are usually proteins that are involved in the assimilation of iron and sulfur and sodium transport. So that was, uh, you know, some good, interesting finding about this convergence between some of these groups, large groups of bacteria shared between these two groups of vertebrates. Now, we did not find the, uh, our previous finding about the fusobacteria being so common on vampire finches and none on our rest of the finches, uh, we didn't find any of them in the vampire bats. Um, to be honest, they were actually a little bit more on the non-blood feeding uh, bats in our comparisons. And one of the other bacteria that was very common on our analysis was uh, Cytobacterium sumeri, which is known to produce vitamin B12. Um, that can be very important in, uh, in metabolism of folate for the uh, vampire finches. So, so, when we, so we, we have this taxonomy kind of mixed results. But the next thing that we wanted to look at is their convergence in function. So are there genes uh, that these bacteria might have that allow to have a different metabolism um, between you know, these two groups of uh, vertebrates that might have something, maybe the bacteria are not the same, but the function of the bacteria are similar. So we look at the similitude of the microbiome and we use the um, the KO, KEG Ortholog database, you know, there's the Kyoto Encyclopedia of genes and genomes to find out the association between the genes that we can find on each one of them uh, for known um, functions. Known functions of interest are the ones that we have here on each one of these graphs. And for bats and for finches, um, we, will, we will wanted to find out if there was any overlap between some of the genes that would share the same um, uh, metabolism a function as this convergence between the two blood feeding vertebrates. And one of the interesting things that we find is that there's quite a bit of overlap. So there were 70 unique KOs for bats and 50 unique KOs for the vampire finches. But there was a 40 percent, you know, 40 of these KOs that were overlapping between our two vertebrate animals feeding on blood. And some of the most important ones were in the catabolism or metabolism of amino acids. Um, some heme iron uh, groups as well, and the same thing for uh, the short um, chain fatty acid um, 
that we also found to be very important between them. So to wrapping up a little bit these this two uh, papers, uh, we found there was a weak taxonomical convergence between vampire finches and our bats that you know feed on blood. And we did find some strong functional convergence between some of the metabolism and the um, functions for the genes that are helping these species probably to obtain nutrients uh, from blood. Now, um, this is very interesting that to find some convergence between quite distantly related species of Hematophagus. Now, we have many different species, uh, sorry, questions that we are going to start looking in the next uh, few months, if, if all um, allows. We want to find out what's the origin of fusa bacteria in the Galapagos, how that bacteria got to these tiny islands, allowing these birds to take a completely different evolutionary trajectory that will allow them to feed on blood uh, from these lectured birds. And what is the role of fusa bacteria in the uh, metabolic role in blood digestion? We are also starting to get data on saliva proteomics. We know that some bats have these incredible draculin proteins that allow them to numb areas for the, for the bat to, to uh, obtain blood. Um, but we are still you know, going to uh, get more data on the saliva proteomics of the vampires finches from the Galapagos. So I think we, you know, we have answered several interesting questions, uh, but only time will tell um, of how many other new and interesting uh, questions we have to explore in the future. So I'm just leaving with this quote by Dracula. Thank you. And um, again, if you have any, any questions, please um, let me know. Um, Cynthia has a question. Sure. Cynthia, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for uh, an exciting talk. Uh, I wonder if the bats that you were analyzing, are they from the same uh, island? the same uh, niche that these birds feed on and uh yeah yeah so the uh, the vampire bats are not from the galapagos so vampire bats work from completely different uh region in central america these the, the 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 vampire finches they only live in these two tiny you know islets or little islands on the galapagos islands so there's there's no conversion that they don't even share uh geographic space at all so the differences that we see in the population of the microbiome, could they be attributed to the, to the differences in niches? And, and could you find a species that is more relatable in terms of, you know, the ecology of, of, of these vampire finches? Yeah, there's nothing really close to the, the diet of the vampire finches. There is uh, two um, sister species uh, of finches that live on other islands, but they do not um, go after these birds to eat uh, blood. So they're you know, they're generalists, they will eat um, some insects, they will have some seeds. So these are the close relatives, but they're, they're very different on the microbiome they possess. They, they don't possess anything like it that the vampire finches microbiome on these islands. Um, Jose has a question. Hi, um, excellent talk. Um, I was thinking just outside the microbiome, have you looked at the genome of these um, species and have you found like any pattern in terms of uh, yes. Yeah, Thank you yeah. for asking. This is this is our next step. So we're going to start doing some uh, full gene sequencing of these these uh, these birds, uh, because there are some very good data sets already on the you know metagenomics, microbiome, and genomics of of vampire bats, and there have have some incredible findings about the role of the genes and microbiomes, and we want to uh, replicate that on vampire finches. So we are going to start doing that as well. Great, thank you so much, Jaime. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is um, Morgan Farrell. She's a master's student working at the Cal Academy with um, one of our curator, Dr. Rebecca Albright. She's going to talk about her ongoing work on coral microbiome. And actually Morgan's project is so fresh that she was still collecting data up to get kicked out in the lab back in March. So she'll be giving an introduction of her system and telling you the type of question she wants to ask. All right, take over, Morgan. Okay, let me present my screen. Thank you, Athena. So let's see. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yep, you're perfect. Okay, thank you. 
Um, yes, so I'm going to tell you uh, about my master's thesis, and since I don't have any data yet, I'm mostly going to tell you what I've done so far. So I'm working on um, spatial and temporal variation of microbial communities within the surface mucus of corals. Um, as many of you know, corals are declining globally, and many are focusing on restoration as a technique to restore small-scale areas of the reef or to focus on specific species that we want to save. And Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, is one area, is one city that is really focusing on restoration to restore their very low coral cover of their reefs. And so Fundacion Grupo Punta Cana is one restoration program that is running the most of the outplanting and restoration of Punta Cana. And I'm partnering them with them to um, use their outplanting techniques and their coral nursery as a model for understanding coral microbiome and specifically to try to understand what factors make for successful restoration programs and understanding how the coral microbiome could be driven by the genotype of the coral you're using because we're specifically focusing on Acropora cervicornis, which is a really fast growing species, or maybe the site that we're planting these corals into. And also to look for any features that could be contributing to um, really high levels of coral performance and higher growth rates. And so corals are colonial organisms. Um, you can see the picture on the right is an individual polyp and they work together with thousands of polyps to uh, create an entire organism that functions as one. And so one polyp has a, a skeleton, a, a mouth and a gastric cavity and it has coral tissue, but it also has a surface mucus layer. And this tissue is producing mucus as a form of defense. It's really a barrier between the water column and the coral animal itself. And so the surface mucus layer is an interesting area to focus on because it really is the coral's first line of defense against invading pathogens or a change in the environment. And it has very rapid turnover of the mucus and the microbes themselves. So I'm focusing specifically on the coral surface layer, that mucus surface layer um, for my study. And so the questions that I'm hoping to answer are whether genotype of the coral or the site that these corals are planted into is driving the mucus microbial community. And what time scales do we actually see these microbial changes occurring when we're changing them from environments? Um, and whether my experimental corals that I outplanted have any similarities in their microbial community to corals that have been established in these sites for much longer period of time. And then if there's any microbial taxa that are correlating with um, physiological response. And so my experimental design is that I have uh, four outplanting sites along the coast of Punta Cana. And I also back transplanted corals into that coral nursery to control for the effects of handling. I have um, five genotypes, which were genotyped in conjunction with Grupo Punta Cana and the University of Miami, as well as uh, five replicates. So I outplanted a total of 125 corals, and then I resampled the mucus of these corals um, over four time points. So I have before they were outplanted and before I handled the corals, I sampled mucus one week after outplanting, two weeks, and my final time point is four weeks. And so these are all of the locations where Grupo Punta Cana has restoration projects going. And as many small scale nonprofits, they don't have a lot of effort and a lot of time to go back and have outplanting success data taken on all of these sites and to understand how the corals are actually performing after they're outplanting them. So I went through and did um, took outplanting success data on about 50 of their sites to help inform which sites I would choose for my project. And so I ended up with these four blue pins as my outplanting sites. And then the red pin is the coral nursery, which is where all of the corals came from. And so I tagged and gave each coral an individual ID tag so I can follow that coral through time. And I swabbed their mucus using um, a sterile cotton swab. And so I have a video. This is just sort of showing um, the process of the swabbing. And I was mostly, mostly focusing on um, avoiding areas where the microbial community could be vastly different, such as the growing tips, those apical tips as well as the junction between um, two branches. And so I also took environmental measurements. I have water samples 
both to characterize the microbial community of the water and compare that to the microbial community of my samples, but also to have um, nutrient levels for each site. I, I also have um, light and temperature data that was taken continuously for the course of the experiment. And for physiological measurements, I have a photo data set of every coral for every time point so that I can track coral growth through time, but also any changes in the coral health. And so for sample analysis right now, all I've gotten through was DNA extraction of all of my samples, um, but I'm hoping to amplify the V3, V4 region and I'm doing 16S RNA amplicon sequencing. And I chose this region um, after a bit of research uh, in coral microbiome work, there's uh, quite a bit of variation on which primer sets uh, different studies have used within 16S. And so I was hoping to find a primer set that um, had a large body of work behind it so that I can compare my results to other studies that have focused on acroporids, which is my genus, and other mucus studies. So that's sort of how I ended up with that specific region. And I'm hoping to sequence using an Illumina MySeq, and I'm doing my bioinformatics um, using Chime too. And so how I plan to analyze these results once I get some is um, for the whether genotype or sites is the stronger driver of mucus community composition, I'm hoping to do an analysis of similarity um, on the operational taxonomic units, which is our proxy for microbial taxa, um, to determine the time scales that the mucus microbial communities are changing. I'm planning to compare the um, abundance and diversity of microbial taxa over each of my time points. Uh, whether the experimental corals are similar to established corals of that same environmental site, I want to look at the percentages of shared OTUs and to understand whether microbial taxa are correlating with physiological response, I hope to compare the dominant OTUs with the coral growth rates and also utilize the program PyCrest to infer if there's any functional groups that um, would correlate with increased coral growth or physiological response. And so I'd just like to thank all of the people that helped me with this project and um, any questions or advice is uh, greatly appreciated. Oops, let's start from the beginning. Okay, um, so for the past uh, year and a half, I have been at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, as a postdoc, and we've been investigating the, um, the microbiome of uh, Arctic permafrost. And the way we have gone about doing this is by uh, synthesizing some previously uh, publicly available metagenomes. So uh, the Arctic ecosystem is obviously important for the uh, endemic and native species that live there and all of the, the communities that reside around the Arctic. Um, we know that it's also crucial for uh, global uh, sort of climate stabilization. It provides a lot of fresh water um, and regulates the Earth's temperature. Uh, it's also extremely vulnerable to climate change. And so it's a, it's a big problem to try to tackle um, how we can uh, prevent it from melting even faster than it already is. One of the ways that the permafrost landscape in the Arctic is changing is by um, inundation and hydrologic changes. So um, when you think of the Arctic, it's um, a polar ice cap, it's an ocean, and then surrounding that ocean is a variety of landscapes. Um, there are tundra landscapes, there are forested landscapes, um, and a lot of the soil underneath those landscapes is permafrost. So it's ground that's been frozen for two or more consecutive years, and there are, um, a, there's a lot of ice in that, um, and also a lot of carbon. So on top of the permanently frozen layer of soils, there's an active layer that freezes and thaws every season. So in the summer, it, will, um, it won't be frozen and then it'll freeze up again in the winter. 
in undegraded permafrost, um, it's a fairly stable system. Um, and there is um, this patterned ground ice uh, can be very close to the surface, especially in the winter. But as we see temperatures rising in the Arctic, one of the things that happens is those ice wedges beneath the surface of the ground and the permafrost layer will start to melt as the permafrost is degraded. And initially this leads to inundation of the surface layers of the soil, and it really changes the uh, redox potential of those soils. So it uh, makes the entire system anaerobic. Eventually, with increasing temperatures, the ice wedges are so degraded that they no longer are providing water to the surfaces. And then the system um, changes again and becomes deeply oxic. So you'll get a different pattern um, in the ground, and there's some amazing aerial photography uh, documenting this change. Um, and then uh, the soils will be oxygenated to a far greater extent. One of the big problems um, for us as scientists and people who live on the planet is the carbon feedback loop here in the system. So there's a, a great proportion of uh, carbon stored in the soils in the Arctic permafrost. And what happens as the temperatures begin to rise um, is that, that uh, those soils will thaw and the microorganisms that live in those soils will start to mineralize the carbon back into greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. And then the increased CO2 or methane increases the temperature further, which further increases the temperature of the soil, which makes even more carbon available for mineralization. And then whether or not um, the soils are in an inundated state or whether they're oxic uh, will change the balance of CO2 or methane. So methane will be released um, when the soils are anaerobic, when they're inundated with water, and more CO2 will be released if the soils are more oxic. So um, this problem uh, is really exacerbated um, in the Arctic, and it's the microorganisms that are doing the transformation of the stored carbon into the greenhouse gases. And for that reason, uh, one of the big questions is what's gonna happen as we continue to warm the Arctic? So to try to tackle this, uh, this question, what we've tried to do is get a baseline for the community structure of the microbiomes in the Arctic. We have 27 sites across the Arctic from which we've collected metagenomes, and those are these points up here on the map. Can you guys see my pointer? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and uh, so we have some patches in our geographic distribution up here. Uh, these sites are very difficult. It's very difficult to get permafrost cores rather than just the active layer cores. So this data set um, is sparse for that reason. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's nice to be starting to do this work to see um, what the baselines look like for the permafrost. So these sites here that I've listed are the names and they are in geographic order longitudinally going uh, across here. And then I've just highlighted um, in this table a few of the important environmental variables. Um, we looked at uh, several more. Um, I think these highlight some of the main features of the, uh, the habitats for these microbiomes. And the main takeaway, there, there are two main takeaways from the environmental data. One is that there's a great amount of variation um, across these sites. And then the other, which I'm not showing here, is that we haven't found any um, pattern either in latitude or longitude with these environmental variables. So the habitats for these microbiomes appear to be very um, local. Um, there's not a lot of gradient across the Arctic, which is interesting in and of itself. So once we had this collection of metagenomes, we analyzed them um, consistently. So we went from raw data all the way to um, metagenome assembled genomes, which is the stage that we're at right now. And I'm just going to share three preliminary results in this, uh, this brief talk. The first thing I'm going to talk about is diversity. So the um, here on the y-axis is a metric of diversity um, using a sequence-based uh, calculation from this program, Nonpareil. So what it does is it um, collects sequence data and then 
estimates the actual diversity based on sequences. These diversity data do, are not derived from database annotations, which helps us out because annotating these mags is quite tricky. Um, there are lots of holes in the database because the microbial world is so much more vast than, uh, than any other part of the tree of life. And then across the top here, each of these box plots is the sites. Um, and this is in the same longitudinal order that I showed on the previous slide. Highlighted in colors are uh, the pH classes here. So moving from very strongly acidic to moderately alkaline. Um, so there are two main takeaways from this plot that really stood out to me. The first is that there's no geographic pattern in the diversity either, um, which makes sense because we don't see much of a trend geographically with the environmental data. And then the other interesting thing is that um, pH here was the, uh, the environmental variable that was most strongly correlated with diversity. And you can see that it's at an extremely weak correlation. <laughs> um, so there's not really many of the environmental variables that are explaining the diversity. It's like I said, it, um, the trend is holding here that it seems to be very local. The next thing that we did was look at the taxonomy of these organisms. And so this is uh, the taxonomy results from the assemblies, not from the metagenome assembled genomes. Um, we are in the process of redoing these, uh, this taxonomy result with the mags themselves rather than with the contigs. And then here is the sites again across the bottom. And then this, uh, this bar on the far right is a uh, the average of all of the sites across the Arctic. So there are a couple of interesting things of note here with this phylum level taxonomy. One is that the actinobacteria are um, a pretty dominant phylum across the Arctic, followed closely by the proteobacteria. Um, and this was a nice sanity check because these are similar results to what we've seen from the individual studies. Um, so it's very good that we're getting <laughs> the same answers here. As much as I hate to generalize about um, phylum level uh, metabolic classifications, the actinobacteria tend to be chemoorganotrophs and they tend to be extremophiles. And so that is also um, uh, makes sense in this context. Um, the actinobacteria do quite well across uh, permafrost in colder environments. And of course the proteobacteria are extremely diverse in their metabolisms. Um, so that's uh, an interesting, to note in terms of the fact that these microbiomes appear to be quite, um, quite regional in terms of their environmental characteristics. So finally, um, what I wanna share is some results that I'm just starting to generate. Um, this is based on the metagenome assembled genomes. We have 1,010 that we were able to bin out from all of these metagenomes. Um, and I've classified the, um, the pathways in the genomes according to four different cycles so far. So methane, iron, nitrogen, and sulfate, which are important biogeochemical processes in permafrost in general. So, um, what we're counting here are the number of mags that have complete pathways. Um, and that was uh, categorized using both KEG um, and a RAS seed annotation pipeline. So the big result here is that iron uptake it seems to be extremely important for these. Almost 80% of the mags have complete pathways for some kind of iron uptake mechanism. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's a very tantalizing result that we'll be looking into um, in the next steps of these metabolic analyses. And then the other thing that I notice here in these preliminary results is um, that sulfur oxidation and ammonification are also present, um, not just steps in the pathways, but complete pathways in more than half of the mags. And um, so like I said before, there's no clear trend in in pH class in across these sites. So what I've been wondering about is the distribution of these mags geographically um, in terms of whether we see mags um, corresponding to different pH classes and partitioning like the sulfur oxidation and the ammonification steps, which would require uh, different redox conditions for those to be favorable. 
so I know this was a very short presentation. Um, if you would like to ask me any more questions or um, discuss this work, I'm happy to do so. Here's my contact information. Um, uh, I respond mostly via email, but I, I do pay attention to my science Twitter feed also. So thank you guys very much for your attention and I look forward to talking more about this with you guys. Thank you, Megan. Any questions for Megan? Okay, our last talk of the day um, is from Ellen Cabrero. Ellen's a grad student at Berkeley and he's going to talk about bee flies. Hello, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, how do I, uh, let's see. Uh, one second. Can everyone see this? Yep. Okay. And... Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alan Cabrera. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley in Kipps Will Lab, where I'm studying the taxonomy and systematics and my, now microbiomes of bee flies. Um, so I'm going to do a really brief introduction on the microbiome, as we're, I'm sure we're all we all know about this, but. It's really cool to me as a taxonomist, learning about the microbiome just got me really fascinated about the system. So we know that the microbiome is a genetic content of the host microbial communities. Um, this includes um, you know, the host genome, the hollow genome, and the environmental metagenome. And you know, this there's like two main types of microbiomes. This is the transient microbiome that's influenced by diet and the environment, and the resident microbiome, which is always found within the host. Um, so, you know, probably all of us at home are our microbiome has probably changed to match that of our home in some way. But I was interested in flies and specifically all the really cool ways that microbes influence um, insect behavior and the acquisition of nutrients and just all aspects of insect life. So, you know, some examples are uh, the microbes can act as a secondary immune system, and this is seen in parasitoid wasps. It can affect development and reproduction. So some studies in um, sarcophagid flies have shown that removing their microbial system really affects the way they develop and most fail to mature to adulthood. Um, how influences the acquisition of nutrients and the ability to access new food resources, the classic example being the aphid. And what I think was really cool when I was reading literature is how uh, microbes influence host selection, animal behavior specifically in parasitoid wasps and Asonia. And so this kind of got me thinking, like, what about flies? You know, flies are one of the largest orders of insects, about 150,000 plus species. Uh, but most of this, there's been a lot of studies on microbiomes of diptera, but mostly in very few species of flies and typically the medically and agriculture important. So our mosquitoes, Drosophila, blowflies and fruit flies. And most of these studies have focused on Wolbachia or bacterial diversity and behavior. So you know, what are bee flies? I think they're the cutest flies on the planet, although many people might disagree. Um, you know, we have our, our fuzzy friends here, and these are commonly found in arid and uh, deserty environments. Um, they're a large cosmopolitan family of about 5,000 species, which is a bit more of the diversity than mammals. Uh, adults are pollinators, and in some instances, they're the keystone pollinators for a desert um, system. Specifically, some examples have shown how they're the most important pollinator for the Cape Floristic province in South Africa. So they're a pretty big deal, but there's very little known about them. And as larvae, uh, they're parasitoids. Uh, so a parasitoid is an insect that uh, develops- Hey, Alex, sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, can you click present on your PowerPoint? We're still seeing your first slide. Oh no, <laughs> I, thought, uh, I thought I did hit present. Uh, so we're, we're seeing your full screen, um, but the PowerPoint program is not presenting. So go to the lower lower right corner. Uh, let's see here. I thought I, uh, is that working or no? Alan, are you using two, two screens, two monitors? No, I just have a different tab okay, open. Uh, let me see here. Um, I'll just stop presenting and try again. Uh, how about now? Yep, we see a full screen now. Is it changing slides? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, 
I should I start all over? I guess I'll just go through the photos really quick. <laughs> Is that okay for everybody? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds okay. Good. Sorry. All right. It just went completely quiet, so I'm kind of worried. Oh yeah. No. no. Uh, uh, so here is my photo of the transient microbiome and the resident microbiome and my bee fly. And uh, what I really got interested in is the host microbe interactions and how. Uh, uh, sorry, microbiomes really affect kind of all aspects of insect life, from secondary immune systems to development and reproduction. Uh, to the acquisition of nutrients and, and ability to access new food resources. And the coolest thing I thought was how it influences host selection in parasitoid wasps. And as I was digging through the literature, there's not much known about dipterin parasitoids. Mostly all studies have focused on like medically important or agriculturally important flies like mosquitoes, Drosophila, and most of these focused on Wolbachia or uh, bacterial diversity. Um, so, you know, Parasitoid flies are, you know, and within Diptera, parasit the parasitoid lifestyle has evolved multiple times and independently of each other. So it's like a really big deal. And so this kind of got me thinking about bee flies. So these are bee flies. <laughs> As I said, they're some of the cutest flies on the planet and they kind of look like flying cotton balls. Um, they're really diverse. There's about 5,000 species. Uh, adults are pollinators, um, so they're visiting flowers to uh, gather nutrients for their uh, egg development, at least the females are. And as larvae, they're parasitoids, and so parasitoids, insects, are insects that develop in or on a host, and they kill the host uh, as part of the, the development life history. So uh, they can be ectoparasitoids, which are uh, found on the outside, endo, which are found inside the inside of the insect, and hyperparasitoids, which they're found within, within a parasitoid that's, so it's a parasitoid within a parasitoid within a host. And so here we have a uh, tiger beetle larva, and uh, we can see uh, these maggots uh, on the outside, they're gonna eat it alive over time. So what were my research objectives? Or do bee flies even have a microbiome? And if so, what is influencing the patterns of bacterial diversity? You know, is it ecology, phylogeny, or is it a completely random? And so going through my methods, uh, so individuals were collected throughout Southern California and genomic data was extracted for 36 individuals. Uh, this included eight subfamilies and 18 genera, which is pretty much all the diversity of bee flies found in North America, besides some really rare things that I couldn't get my hands on. And we used uh, 16 S RNA amplicon sequencing. And our samples are pro processed using the UPARS pipeline and statistical analysis was done in R. And so uh, some of my results, uh, we had about 435,000 reads, and this is about 1,500 bacterial OTUs, which is, comes out to about 115 bacterial OTUs per bee fly host. And so first, looking at uh, microbial species accumulation curve, uh, this is kind of showing that given our sampling efforts and the samples we had, we, we did kind of capture the majority of the diversity found within the bee fly. So more sampling probably wouldn't improve uh, Kind of the, our sample size. Uh, next, we're kind of interested to see uh, how, if the bacterial uh, community is clustered by parasitoid lifestyle. So this is between the ecto, endo, and uh, hyperparasitoid, and also some egg parasitoids. And there really was no pattern. And this is probably because very few of the hosts are known for bee flies. Only about 10% of um, all host records are known. This is because they're really hard to collect. And you know, it's they're really hard almost impossible to rear in the lab. So we really need to know what they're on before we could really test this. Uh, next, we looked at whether there's some phylogenetic symbols. So we compared a community dendrogram to the bombolid phylogeny. And the colors are just associated with the different subfamilies. And again, no real pattern. So phylogeny is probably not driving the bacterial communities within bee flies. Uh, next, we looked at the abundance of bacteriophila by host subfamily. And this is pretty cool. A lot of the subfamilies had a large amount of proteobacteria and uh, cyanochloroplast bacteria in yellow. And this is associated with like, which makes sense given that they're pollinators and nectar feeders. I think the, the most exciting results from uh, this study, uh, we looked at the OTU table and found that, <clears throat> that um, these bacterial species were found in 75% of all samples. Um, and so in blue, uh, 
these bacteria typically associated with nectar feeding insects. So these have been found in other insects in their salivary glands and mouth parts. So given that bee flies are pollinators, this kind of makes sense that they have this type of bacteria. Um, they also, we also found this uh, mesmoplasma bacteria, which when I dug through the literature, the only other insects that had evidence for having this were uh, fungus uh, farming uh, <clears throat> leaf cutter ants. And uh, one second, water and uh, predatory army ants. And so what what do these two ants share is that they process chitin. So what would a bee fly need this bacteria for? And possibly it's using this bacteria when it's in the parasitoid stage, feeding on another insect. And so it needs to break down that chitin uh, to develop. And then a lot of enterobacteriaceae, um, not sure exactly what species, but maybe they have some symbionts as well. And then uh, we scale this back. Um, to see uh, what, what bacteria species were found in 50% of all samples. And a lot of bacteria associated with soil and specifically soil bacteria that's been found to help with the development of, of insect larva. Uh, so this is just kind of showing that there is possibly some sort of uh, resident microbiome because these um, all these uh, bacterial species were found in up to 50 to 70% of all our samples. So that's kind of really cool and it's interesting to see how the bacteria found really kind of lines up with what we know about bee fly biology. Um, so what does this take in the future directions? Um, so we kind of have like a rough baseline established for bee flies and it'd be cool to continue with maybe some shotgun sequencing to understand like composition, structure, and function and really try to figure out what the resident microbiome of bee flies are. I really wish I could read them in the lab and I've kind of tried, but it's really hard. So maybe one day in the future I can do that to really have some really robust experiments. And with that, my acknowledgements, and 